shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone and welcome back to the time shifters podcast this is your host christopher and i'm here as always with my good friend and co-host tom hello folks in the great unknown how are you doing today tom oh not too bad you know it was a it's been a weird day it's been a very weird day it's been an odd couple weeks it's it's one of these weeks where not a lot has happened, yet it feels like it went by really quick. Uh-oh. Like, I had to double check before I sat down to record tonight. I was like, is this really the date we're going to record? Because <laughs> this it can't have been two weeks already. There, There's a little bit of that element. We're also recording at the last week of August, which means it is school time. Yes. Uh, which yes. means and- far more to, to me than some, seeing as how I work at a university. <laughs> Well, uh, it's only been uh, noticeable by me by the increased traffic and the buses that I run into to and from uh, work. But um, yeah, that 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 was one of my moments this morning. It is uh, it, it there was a bit of a downpour this morning, right when I was supposed to be running. Um, by the time I get ready to start my day, get out the door. Um, the rain's not there, but it's wet everywhere. But now you have wet roads with too many cars on it and my commute which is normally only about 15 minutes turned into 45 that's quite the jump yes little, little, understood a little, little bit it'll chill out what as people figure out oh this is how we get around again but yes i have to wait for them to get there <laughs> i can't believe that we're lo- near in the end of august i mean by the time everyone hears this we'll be well into september so i mean the summer is over fall has begun uh, the Comic Expo is right around the corner. Indeed, I yes. have up, I I have applied for and been granted our uh, press passes. Hooray! So good, yes, that was very exciting. I almost missed it. I that's Ooh. how fast this month has gone. Is it only occurred to me like, oh wait a minute, this is the end of August. This thing is a month away. Yep. I wonder if the press pass applications are up. <laughs> well, it turns out press pass applications expire in like a week. <laughs> Which, which stands to reason, but that means they've been up since probably July. <laughs> no, they they never put them up that early. Oh, no. They probably they probably opened up at the early at the start of the month. Probably, okay, so we've had about a four week window, and you were running out. <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, I applied, and within two or three days, they, they were granted, and I have our passes. So we will be at the Comic Expo. I, we just got news today too that uh, for anyone listening that's planning on going to the expo. You have to buy your tickets. You have to buy them in advance of the show. They will not be taking cash or charge admission at the door. Well, I missed that. Uh, really? Yeah, that was just uh, just came out on their Twitter and Facebook and everything today. That if you you want to get to the Comic Expo, you got to buy your tickets in advance. I wonder why they've opted for that model. It's it's interesting. Other maybe it's just a matter of um, just trying to not deal with one more thing at the door you know uh, you don't have to deal with um the technology you don't have to deal with the cash um i don't know i'm I'm curious to see if it affects the uh amount of people yeah i i'm curious of that i'm also curious like how much in advance do you have to could you like literally go on their web page day of and buy yeah. tickets and just do it that way. Christopher jumping in here to let everyone know that you can buy your tickets the day of the event. You just have to do it before you actually get to the admission line. Dear listeners, anyone interested in going, please go out to the site and read it thoroughly, but understand that you cannot buy them at the door. Yes. So, so figure out if you need them now or if you can buy them right up to the moment you go. 
it, it is definitely a, a time of changes for the expo. We got that going on next year. It I think is going to be seeing a a, a scaled down comic expo because they have to move out of the Duke Energy Center while they do remodeling mm -hmm. and updates. So we'll be moving up to the Sharonville Convention Center, which is probably considerably half the smaller. size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which will be interesting because, if anything, I can honestly say the Cincinnati Comic Expo has been growing over the years, and successfully so. I, I at least that's the impression I get. Yeah, they're definitely, I think, going to have to scale it back a little bit. So we have a really big guest list this year, as we have had in past years. I'm guessing you're going to see a much smaller roster of guests and artists frankly. Um, we also have to play out the next few weeks because as the moment of this recording, the strike is still in session. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how that impacts guest attendance or at least what they do when they're here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I was, they did say that, um, well, Christina Ricci was again supposed to be there and again had to cancel out. Mm. I'm not sure what she's doing, <laughs> but she must have something going on. Right. Or did she opt out because she can't really talk about any of this stuff because that would go against the rules of the, the strike. The rules of the strike, yeah. So. Well, I know there is one... Um, boy, I'm blanking on the name of it. There's one production company that is actually still producing things... Yeah, the company, it was uh, A24 is is the company that has agreed to a lot of things and have worked out some sort of interim agreement so they can continue producing whatever they had in the pipeline. That's amazing, and it answers the question whether or not um, media production companies do collective bargaining as, a, as an entity or if they literally are all individuals and they have to fight their own fights with the... Uh, sag after yeah i'm not sure i have not on the inside of that and yeah, i'm no I'm, i don't have that kind of insider information <laughs> <laughs> no but if anyone would like to give us insider information please <laughs> if, any, if any celebs are listening that are currently on strike and want to come on the podcast and talk about the strike <laughs> if you're doing work with a24 we'd love to hear about it they're the company. They're they're the producer. They did the everything, everywhere, all at once mm -hmm. film. I mean, they it's a, it's a hell of a name. They've they've got some. Um, they're right in the crest of the wave right now. I think because of that, and so yeah, I can see why they would not want to just suddenly shutter the doors and windows. No, and imagine being the only production company in town allowed to churn anything out. You have the. The the lay of the land, the play of the field, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> they could make avant-garde films <laughs> because what else are you gonna watch? <laughs> right. And they'll they'll still find their way to the theaters because <laughs> maybe and, and just maybe some original content could actually get made. <laughs> uh, I think you're Going a little bit uh, crazy there. I know, and as a guy that likes his franchises too, every once in a while it would be nice to see something, you know, new. Fresh, <laughs> yeah. fresh and new, yeah. Different take on things, maybe actual, not something everybody has seen a thousand times over. Yeah, that would be refreshing, absolutely. <laughs> that is, in its own sort of weird way, a bit of a segue to something we want to talk about here at the, at the start of the show. We recorded our last episode on Space Battleship Yamato, and we said goodbye, and we stopped recording, and then we talked for about a half an hour about all the things that we wanted to talk about, or we should have talked about, in the episode of Space Battleship Yamato. So this is a Space Battleship Yamato retrospective. Yeah, it, it's, it's a film that every time I watch it, and I didn't realize this until... You know, after we recorded, after we, I watched it and then recorded about it, whenever I watch the film, it's the film I think about for like a week going, boy, I wish this. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't help it. One of the things we touched on a little bit in the recording was the music. You mentioned that you felt like it was it was there, 
but it was subtle. Yeah, it was a little muted for my taste. Yeah, and and I, I and I do agree, and like the real touchstone tunes and everything were like used in the front end of the film. And then sort of forgotten. I don't really recall them really bringing them back for a lot of the the scenes. And a lot of that is because, and this is really interesting because I went back and I I was starting to listen to some of the soundtrack. The soundtrack is available. You find it on YouTube and stuff. You listen to that soundtrack. If you just listen to the soundtrack and you've never seen the film, when you listen to that music, you're thinking, I mean, you're seeing explosions and battles and excitement yeah. and, and and nonstop action. And that's not in that film. Yeah, no. That, it, that is not the film. So it's like, I can see why this music isn't used so much because there's no place for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and that was one of the things that made the series so much fun is... Uh, you could hear, like, you knew what was going to happen when all of a sudden you, you heard the guitar solo start to pick up. You get to the ding, 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 ding. You knew, okay, the ship's pulling out. We're going into battle. <laughs> and there was a, li- a little of that lacking from there. But uh, one of the things, too, um, because the music was so subtle, I, I do recall afterward we had remembered one of the more poignant pieces of music the uh, part of the film but because we're getting their version of uh and, and i'm just going to use the uh, star blazers terminology the starship character who is mm-hmm. essentially just taking over the body of another character in this particular case um but while we're having our conversation with her that very dramatic uh choral piece um is playing but because it's a little it's so underlying the rest of the actual um, dialogue that's happening. It's not as obvious and it's not making you feel anything. And it's right. a missed opportunity. And it's, and it's one of my favorite pieces mm-hmm. from the old uh, Star Blazers cartoon. I've been going back occasionally and watching some of that series. And the music is probably maybe at least 50% of why I enjoy that show. Oh, yeah. The music, it is phenomenal. Oh. And that operatic sort of, qua- uh, what'd you call it? Uh, uh, choral, choral piece. piece. Is one of my favorites. I love that piece of music. Mm-hmm. And to not have it kind of like really in the forefront. Yeah, because I mean, that, well, one, the piece of music is dramatic as all can can be. I mean, that's the tearjerker moment. It. You're, when you're playing that, something dramatic should be happening. And when they chose to use it, it was not super dramatic and we didn't really hear it. So it didn't, it's kind of like they had the right elements, but they didn't put them in the right order. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and yeah, no, and I've been rewatching um, the uh, ba- uh, Space Battleship uh, Yamato 2199, the the more recent version of the Iskandar uh, storyline from the original Space Battleship Yamato and and the Star Blazers cartoon. And the music in there is on point. It is right, right there where you want it. It's all the tunes that you're used to. It's just all of it straight up Japanese. But yeah, the thing about the music is I even remember it had been a decade since... I, I had seen anything related to Star Blazers or Yamato, and every once in a while, it's like an earworm that'll dig back in, and I could sing the entire theme song <laughs> right out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, and the thing of it is, it's that earworm that sets in, and I'm like, I'm not unhappy about this. Right. I'm digging it. It's actually kind of energizing my day. <laughs> so. You watch the cartoon and you, you watch two or three episodes 
it's not like they compose new music for the for each episode. So right. you're hearing the same touchstone songs mm-hmm. over and over again. So you think you kind of would get tired of them. But then you, when you get to the film, you're like, I want nothing more than for that song to come back. Right. Oh, yeah. No. And, and likewise, at the end of the film, uh, when it's going down, Kodai's going to go down with the ship. It's going to save the day, but it has to do essentially a kamikaze run to get this done. And that's when you want the timpanis dialing up going, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, the, yes, the real, the real deep, slow version of yes. the song. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's when you need that, and it's not there. <laughs> Makes me sad. Just the notion of the stuff that was pretty, the exterior shots and all that, they, we, they got them right. But if you actually boiled it down to how much time it was on screen, almost nil. Yeah, half an hour, maybe, out of a two-hour film. Tops, and even when you're seeing some of the more impressive stuff, like every gun is going off on the, the ship, and you're getting a little flyby, and you actually can count it off to about ten seconds. And like, mm-hmm. really? That's all we got? <laughs> and I mean, we talked about it there must have been budget constraints yeah. and that was just what they could afford to render. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I mean, they did an amazing job with what time they had. And I think that also led to like, like there are some standard sound effects that were always in place during the cartoon and they just weren't during there. So you'd have very, very quiet scenes on the bridge and it needed to fill the landscape you know what I kind of missed in the film? I wish they would have done it at least once, was to have the captain lower down in the chair, in his in his big captain's chair to the bridge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a little unclear whether or not his quarters were directly above the bridge like they were. But yes, I would have killed to see him climb in his chair and have it just come down the side. That would have been yeah. cool as hell. Just just, just once. That's, that's all I would... I didn't want him to... Didn't need to see him going up and down or whatever. Just just to do, see it once. That would have been really awesome. Oh, it absolutely would. And, and and since I went back and started rewatching some of 2199 right after we had watched the film, um, I was still thoroughly impressed with how much of the set work was pretty damn close. Not Not spot on, but very doable, very realistic compared to... The, what they had painted in the cartoon, which obviously wasn't ever going to be a thing, right. <laughs> not in its entirety. But they tried really hard. They had lots of really good elements. It's just... Well, it was definitely, I think, inspired a bit by Battlestar Galactica reboot. Sure. The interiors, you could have walked from one set to another and not really realized you're on a different set and on, on some occasions. No, very true, and uh, that was even more notable when we would get the few exterior shots, particularly with the fighters. Um, they were very good to include um, the the thrusters that were all over that would change the direction of the ship and all yeah. that. They were even good about having thrusters on the Yamato to change direction and all, and I'm like, okay, well, those are cool. I like that. That was a nice mm-hmm. touch. Um I know we didn't discuss it at all. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity. Why did Kodai's starfighter be able to split the nose like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, it was one of those things that was bothering me after we had finished the show and that I'd seen him like, there's a scene where literally the nose bends down at a 90 degree angle yeah, he does this sort of break, and it suddenly turns into like a, almost like a macross style um, something. What is it, the Vertalk or uh, so I, I'm saying it wrong. I forget uh, what the the terminology when it's part plane, part robot. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it looked like they were going for that something like that, and then they took it a little further because we didn't talk about analyzer. We, no, that is true. And, the uh, what do you call it? Once he crashed landed the planet, and he uh, his analyzer has always just been as a little box on his belt, right? 
and he could actually plug it into the ship. Right. Into his Cosmo uh, Zero. Yeah, the Cosmo Zero. And at some point, they're pinned down by by all the Gamalas uh, 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 soldiers, and he instructs Analyzer to go. Uh, what did the? Uh, I don't remember what the command was. <laughs> standalone mode or whatever, and it turns into like a really beefy version of like <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. All of a sudden, he's the he's the analyzer slash uh, what was it? IQ ninety nine or something I, like IQ IQ nine IQ nine mm-hmm. IQ nine from Star Blazers analyzer from Yamato. But uh, yeah, same coloring, same dome R two D two stolen <laughs> domed head. And only he's got four arms and he stands about ten feet tall. <laughs> right. And he's armed to the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like your Star Cruiser wasn't as well armed as the robot that apparently lived inside of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, and, and then even that we get we get analyzer showing up. Now, of course, he's a badass, but uh, not the analyzer that we knew. Because uh, at least from Star Blazer's point of view, I don't know if there was a translation problem, but that was the. Sc- Scaredy cattiest robot that ever existed. That thing was always <laughs> running from something. Um, I, I don't recall. Uh, but. No, I, I remember it distinctly because uh, it always hung out with the doctor, too. And the doctor and the cat and analyzer slash IQ9 always wanted to be away from the action. <laughs> so uh, I remember that was always the comedic fodder part. So it was kind of ironic that now Analyzer is a big badass that's going to kick everyone's butt. But even that only lasted for like seconds. We get to see yeah. him fight, and then the next thing we know, it's a pile of junk, and you can barely make out that that's even what Kodai is looking at. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a little sad, but it was cool for the moment. Yes. Yeah, there's just so much. Boy, I, I, I wish they had done kind of moments in that film. <laughs> My co co host is back. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, we, we just wanted to get some of these things out of the way. Um, if anyone has a chance to go, the soundtrack is absolutely amazing. Yeah. It sounds so good because it is like a big orchestral piece i mean i i don't believe it's electronic i think this is an orchestra performing all this stuff and it sounds amazing it sounds like something that you you can you can imagine a 10 out of 10 film in your head oh yeah no, based that, on that soundtrack that, that's the thing even if you're not familiar with any of the program at all i dare you to not like the music it, it gets the juices stirring yeah, but also much like the film, the big touchstone themes are in the front end, the first <laughs> song or two, <laughs> and then there are some stuff in the middle that's kind of inspired yeah. by or whatever, but it's still not derivations on the theme, but not quite there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they did in the film. I was only reminded of it because it's just the episode I watched recently of Star Blazers. There's that one tune that's sort of like the the more lighthearted sort of uh jazzy tune when oh. like things are going well and then it's like the 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 tigers are are flying and stuff and homer think you can hit it I don't know if they use that in the film at all. And I think that's a great tune. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm struggling to remember if that made an appearance. But yeah, I know. I do know that it was included in the 2199 stuff. So mm-hmm. they they're almost lifted all of the music note for note and put it in the next cartoon, which was amazing. But yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about. It, it, it's the... There is even a, a version of it where it's almost a little sinister, but it's still that kind of jazzy thing. They use it mm-hmm. for when they're going into like some kind of moody, dark, uh, mysterious place. But yeah, it, that stuff was always awesome, and that was part of what was missing from a for us from that film is 
just kind of toned it all down and didn't give it the grandeur that it deserved. No, no, I, I definitely think that it was uh, budget issues, not being able to render as much as they might have liked. And as we talked about in the episode, I, I do believe that maybe there is just a... Um, this is for Japanese audiences and this is for American audiences. And we're looking for the film that would have been made for an American audience. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I've always seen that there have been periodic attempts to try to create a, a, a star blazer slash Yamato movie in the American uh, production company venue, but it uh, nothing ever gets off the ground. No, I, I do remember. I don't know if we talked about it. There was a there was talk years like in the eighties or nineties or something about doing an Americanized version with like a resurrected battleship oh, Arizona. Yeah, we did mention this in the last show because it was uh, they thinking about using like the Iowa or some or the Arizona. It, it was the Arizona. The Arizona. Yeah. And I I don't think it would really. I don't think it would work. <laughs> It just it doesn't work. No, and, and that goes with the other part that we did discuss in the show, which is that the, the Japanese have a reverence for this particular ship, um, and there's we just don't have that. No, I mean maybe there is a maybe there is a generation that has a different feeling towards the ship, but it's not something that's passed on through the generations. Right. Where I still think it might be a little bit somehow. Uh, maybe because it's ingrained in the culture in Japan. Could be, and it's one of those things we we can't we can't fully appreciate or know because we're just not that sensitive to that culture. We don't have the background. Let's finally leave that behind. Yep. We've said our piece. <laughs> not so fast, Christopher. Breaking in one more time. We completely forgot to mention the song that actually closes out this film. A song by Steven Tyler, Love Lives. Next time we watch the film, <laughs> you, at, um, at least you'll understand how much this one actually touches us and how we wanted it to be more than it was. <laughs> Let's take a break here mm -hmm. and we'll listen to a promo from their podcast. And then when we get back, we're going to look at a film that a lot of people were really looking <laughs> forward to because it had been almost 30 years since the original film that this uh, is a sequel of when we take a look at Tron Legacy. Podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here are your hosts, Derek M. Cook, and his ever rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not so classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher. Or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Bryce, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Oh. 
I promised you that if I ever got any information about your dad, I'd tell you first, right? I was paged last night. Came from your dad's office at the arcade. So? So? The number's been disconnected for 20 years. Two nights before he disappeared, he came to my house. He said he was about to change everything. Science, medicine, religion. He wouldn't have left that, Sam. He wouldn't have left you. Alan, you're acting like I'm gonna find him sitting there working. Just, hey kiddo, lost track of time. Wouldn't that be something? Tron Legacy was released in 2010. It was directed by Joseph Kaczynski, uh, and this is his feature-length debut. It was a much-anticipated sequel to the 1982 film Tron, and stars Garrett Hedlund as Sam Flynn. Jeff Bridges reprises his role as Kevin Flynn and also portrays the program Clue. Bruce Boxleitner also returns as Alan Bradley. The film also stars Olivia Wilde as Cora, the last isomorphic algorithm, a race of programs that spontaneously evolved on the grid as opposed to being created by users. Kevin Flynn, after taking over the Incom Corporation, disappears. Twenty-some years later, his adult son Sam, the largest stakeholder in Incom, but with no desire to do anything about it, but other than being a thorn in the side of the current CEO, is told of a pager message from member of the board Alan Braid, uh, Bradley. This message came from the now-closed Flynn's Arcade. Sam investigates and discovers a secret computer lab. Upon activating it, he is transported to a computer wor world called The Grid, a world created by Kevin Flynn. Separated from the internet and other systems, it has evolved on its own. It is a place that Kevin hoped would become a perfect world, but his program Clue becomes corrupted and takes over and shapes the grid in a totalitarian state with him as ruler. Clue has devised a way to transport himself and his army to the real world to, con to continue his program of creating the perfect world. Sam has to survive the games and find his father, still trapped within the grid, in order to stop Clue and end his plans of conquest. This is a film I definitely saw in the theater when it came out oh yeah i was pretty excited about seeing it i may have even sprung for the 3d on this one i'm not entirely sure I'm but pretty sure i saw it in 3d and i know i was all in at the beginning because uh there was all sorts of promotional stuff online you could play a light cycle uh routine on the new new bikes from mm -hmm. disney's website and all that i was all over this thing <laughs> They absolutely promoted this thing big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a property that they had absolutely no problem in um, in marketing, uh, unlike a film that I think we'll talk about a little later this year uh, from Disney. But yeah, I mean, so everyone was geared up for this. This is almost 30 years since the original Tron. Tron had become, while it was barely successful if at all yeah. you know when it originally aired 
or aired when it originally debuted, you know, it was in the theaters or whatever. It, it, it has gained quite the cult following mm-hmm. and, you know, it's definitely got its place in sort of like cinema history being one of the first movies to use computer graphics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, the whole, the costuming and all that was all breakthrough stuff. Right. And so I, anyway, this audience member was really excited to see what were they going to bring with this film? You can't have this film and not break some ground. Mm -hmm. I was disappointed. I really feel like they didn't really break much ground with this one, other than maybe trying to, with varying degrees of success, do the de-aging on a couple of the actors. I think that was still pretty, that was kind of fresh technology. Yeah, the... I remember distinctly that first scene, um, actually literally the first scene, when we're watching young Kevin Flynn talking to his then younger son, Sam. Uh, it was pretty cutting edge to to emulate a, young, a younger version of an actor like that, to basically do his capture of what he looked like in 82 and do it again for the big screen. But that's also part of its downfall is as good as it was, it sat in that uncanny valley kind of scenario. It wasn't quite right. Like it was clear it was his face, but it wasn't talking right. It wasn't moving right. It was clearly not real. And that was off putting. Yeah, you can make excuses for it maybe when you're in the grid. Sure. But when you're supposed to be in the real world and you see it, it's just, no, it doesn't hold up. It doesn't work. And, and what's interesting is the few opportunities where we had Bruce Boxleitner actually reprise Tron, um, mm-hmm. whether it's because of the, the fact the scenes were quick and, and all that, his likeness on the character worked a little better than it did for Kevin Flynn, but slash clue. And I think that was because he didn't have as much to do. Possibly. Yeah. He, he's on the screen a lot less and you see him, you don't really see a lot of him close up where you see a, a lot of full frame Kevin Flynn face. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when we've got Kevin and Slash Clue, yeah, you get a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas you, you see Bruce Boxleitner as Tron, he's typically in the background, <laughs> or you see, you know, head to toe. It's not. It's not, not all close up on, up on the face. Right. So you can probably get by with a little bit more that way. Yeah. No, uh, and it, I find it funny that this is essentially a. Disney movie that did that. I don't know how many other films I haven't done any of the research to find out how many have tried to have a younger version of an actor in there. But the the next big time I can even think of them ever digitizing a face of an actor was still Disney. And it's when Disney did Rogue One for Star Wars. And then we had the guy that played Admiral Tarkin and uh, they had uh, Carrie Fisher again as a young Leia. And it was a little better, but still not. Uh, considering the age difference in these two films, it didn't progress as much as you would have hoped. <laughs> no, I actually found the, the young Leia disturbing as all hell <laughs> in Rogue One. <laughs> Yeah, no, I find I have these conversations about that film unto itself with my son because he's a Star Wars fanatic. And, and I I kept telling him it's an amazing film, but anytime they needed those characters, they should have done them as holograms that they were talking to as opposed to try to actually have them as human beings with other human beings. So technology-wise, as far as this film goes, other than the de-aging, there was really nothing groundbreaking or new that I can think of. I mean, it. I think it does look pretty, but I just don't feel like it... It doesn't stand out as being, oh, wow, I've never seen this before. No, no, it does not have that impact. No. And then, even more disappointingly, is I think the story itself is 
rather mundane. It's a very similar story, just tweaked to it's like computer programs instead of the evil king, you know, in some mythological plant, you know, place or something. There, there are plenty of missed opportunities uh, that, that I mean, here's the, the route I'm going to go for you right now. I actually love this film. Really? Love? Love this film. I will watch this film anytime. It is horribly, ridiculously flawed. Uh, the, lead, the lead character, uh, Garrett Hedlund, playing Sam Flynn, is as bland as bland can be. Like, I couldn't give a damn what he is doing on screen. But it, it's such a... Even though it didn't break any ground... I love the Tron universe kind of thing. And going back to the grid, and this is where there's missed opportunity. They introduce the the uh, the characters. The uh, what, 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 what did he call the short name for uh, Quora's, uh Isis. 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 They introduce and dismiss that part so quickly, and that's. That's where the uh, that's where the groundbreaking had possibility. The notion that you could create an art an artificial environment that would spawn its own life form as what you would even we would have to call artificial intelligence, just pure born artificial intelligence, and we didn't explore that more. <laughs> We had to right. we had to do the father son thing, which seemed because of the chemistry chemistry or lack thereof seemed completely forced. But mm -hmm. all of that said, every time I watch it, there's just a huge smile on my face. I just I love the light cycles. I love the discs, um, and it's a video game. So. <laughs> and that's kind of funny. Where I sit is I don't love the film i watch the film and all i think is man i'd love to go play discs of tron right now <laughs> <laughs> it does have a bit of that effect i did actually go do that right after i have a copy yeah. of that <laughs> do you? yeah it's on my xbox so yeah very cool yeah but no i did that right away but yeah I, yeah there <laughs> Again, I, 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 you won't say anything disparaging that I won't absolutely agree with, but I'll still want to go watch it. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I believe me, there are a ton of you know it. I, I there's a ton of films that I'm the exact same uh, way I, about. I know you, and I know some of those films. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the ISOs is such an interesting. They bring it up. It's all in flashback. Of this and the, it was just kind of like, oh yeah, and this happened. And they're going to be the answer to everything, and they're going to be the, the linchpin to, to creating a perfect world. And it's like, why? How? It, no. I, yeah, I, no. And that, that's. The, I don't get it. That's a huge bit part of the flaw, is I think they introduced something exciting and did not explore it or go down any of those paths. Um, that's the other part that I really enjoy and I will defend this part the the whole notion and they didn't build on that because we had to play the father son part which was again bizarre because I don't know how Sam doesn't show up in the grid and go so this is where he's been and he's stuck I, and, and that's the end of that conversation that you can wrap your head around that in a second and, and we drug that out like there was more drama to be had and like if you found out your father that's been missing for 20 years would have absolutely adored to get back to you, but literally could not make that happen, your animosity toward him pretty much melts away in that moment. Like, you can put yourself in his shoes enough. So, no, absolutely. So we miss the part where the actual son in all of this, that's the better thing to explore, is Clue. It's that notion that the great programmer Kevin Flynn had a good idea and needed a, needed a program version of himself to make this world continue to come alive even when he's not there 
And because of a misstep in how he chose to set that code forward, that notion, make the perfect system. We've been down this road in Star Trek and, and other sci-fi. It's the notion of if you may, if you give a simple command that is not something that something can know, what will go horribly wrong <laughs> is going to happen. I liked that element of it, but that's not even where we focused. Uh, they tried a little bit, but but yeah, the 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 infight between Kevin and Clue it is the thing they played lip service to more than anything, and that's where the story was. That and then you bring up this ISO thing, but we don't know anything about it to care. No, absolutely. This should have been um, starring Jeff Bridges. Yes. And, and it should have been his story. It should have been his story dealing with Clue, trying to correct his mistake. It should have been um, him explaining why the ISOs are so important, trying to explain to Clue why the ISOs are so important uh, to, to the evolution of the system and, and the universe or whatever it is that he wants to truly shape and create. Sam should have been... He should have been the afterthought. Yes. He should have been the, oh, and my son's here too. Absolutely. It, it's so weird. The character of Sam was told for like the first, what, 10, 12 years of his life, stories about the grid, stories about what happened to his dad and what happened, you know, and all this stuff. Yeah. And then he finds himself in it and he doesn't understand where he is. And he, 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 we spend a good 20 minutes like, what's going on? What's this? I'm like, we don't need a retelling of Tron for these 20 minutes. Yeah, you don't. And that's the thing where it's trying to build off of the original and then also still misses the boat on a few things. Uh, I, I had to dig in here a little bit because there is a major actor that shows up in this film that does nothing and goes nowhere. Cillian Murphy. Mm. Cillian Murphy, who has had nothing but an amazing career for quite some time, um, and Christopher Nolan uses him for, like, everything. He's currently Oppenheimer, if those don't know by name. Um, but he is featured in the film, at the beginning of the film, as apparently also the son of the bad guy from the first film. Uh, he's Edward Dillinger. He is Dillinger's son, basically Sark, from the, uh, from the first film. We introduce him, and we dismiss him almost as quickly, and you're kind of like, okay, you had an opportunity also to build on that notion that bad guys in the real world have a programmatic bad guy version of them in the Tron world, and we gave that up immediately. We didn't explore that at all. Only Kevin was his own bad guy. Well, and I... Well, they set this whole grid, this whole system... It, it's... it's, it's is, it is its own enclosed yes. universe. Yeah, no. It's, so it it's, doesn't have all these other programmers creating versions of themselves to do their things, like in the original Tron. Tr true, but we, we went out of our way to point out that we brought Tron over from the old system to the new. Uh, and we there are all these other programs that we have no idea who they are, what they are, what they do, uh, or why they're there. Because uh, this is an enclosed system. That was the point of the other one, is that was the global system as much as the, the, a system was global in 1982. Um, so, But the point is, the master control program and all that had free reign of whatever they could get their hands on, and that's where all the programs in the world came from. There's this, essentially Excel and PowerPoint and Word walking around, <laughs> and they just have a human version of who they are uh, and, and they as much as uh, admitted that one of the char characters ram was an actuarial program and they're like okay that's cool that's fun um but we eliminated all of that from this time so flynn has built his own world but we also don't get any background as to where all these other things came from yeah where did clue's army come from 
He's got hundreds of soldier programs. Well, and his his hundreds are him, um, and that was the the scene when Sam shows up on the grid and a recognizer lands and captures him, and there's programs in there, and they're sorting them out as which go in the games and which is uh, they're going to be rectified. And his army is other programs that have been rectified. That's great. Where did all those other programs come from if this is a standalone system that Flynn built? I'm just flexing a little computer nerd cred here. But, Hackers. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's again, it's a standalone closed system. It just exists within Flynn's arcade under underground. It's not attached to anything. So did he write all those other programs? Like when he, we get that first scene where Flynn, young Flynn, has created his grid and he is making clue like literally right there and they do it through a a mirror style thing but it's the two of them in an empty system Mm -hmm. and that thus begins so does does that mean all of those other ones are all just programs that kevin created yeah they're they had a world that they built and they forgot to tell you where the world came from or yeah, why I should exactly. care. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the the original Tron at least postulated that the world is from everything that you know about computers ever. Uh, and that's where they all came from. That's why there that's not even why there were games. There were games in the in Tron because there were video games. Video games were real. This you were just literally watching what was on the other side of the screen when you play it. When you make the little guy run around, you're making this little guy on that one side <laughs> of the screen run around. And we didn't have that element, and that is a part of it, that, that, uh, missing a little bit of a love letter to the original. In the original film, the first time I watched it, it took me a little bit by surprise. It's called Tron, but Tron is kind of a minor character in the film. Yeah. You know, Flynn... Flynn is the is the and the, the protagonist. Yeah, but Flynn of, doesn't of the roll story. off the tongue like Tron. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, this one has Tron legacy, and Tron's even less <laughs> of a character. And I really dislike. I I like the idea of like, oh, he's been captured and he's been corrupted. You know, he's got a corrupted program. And even if you want to talk about his identity, he can split his identity disc in two. Like, you could work with that. You know, where where is the like the battle with of, of the, the the original programming versus the corrupted programming? You know, you should be playing with that. And again, if you told this story as a Kevin Flynn led story, you could have had that 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 theme. You could have had that 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 battle within Tron, uh, with his with sort of his split personality, you know, his his, his the two sides or whatever. In this he's like I'm evil, I'm evil, I'm evil. And in the end, and the, right when it counts, no, I'm a good guy and I fight for the user. It's like, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, it is a <laughs> bit uh, sudden. And of course, that should be a big moment, especially in a movie called Tron Legacy. Yes. Um, and it goes nowhere, does nothing. Um, other than this is the point where I'll at least mention, I have seen it. I don't know if you have. Um there was a cartoon spun off of this movie called Tron Uprising. I tried watching some of it. I I didn't get very far. Yeah, and and it was a bit of a mess too, but it had more potential and would have taken you in better places related to Tron um, than Tron Legacy did. (laughs) It was also not at all any kind of a reveal that uh, Rinsler... Right. The the corrupted version was Tron because a it sounded just like him, and b it still he, he yeah, still had still little T shaped lights, <laughs> and so everyone's like, "What? That's Tron!" Like, no shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a huge reveal. I mean, they your first in your first viewings of uh, Rinsler. The, the the helmet keeps ducking around the top of the T, so you don't get to see it right away. But by the time you get a full standing Rinsler, 
um, as he's going into the uh, the disc battle with him. Um, yeah, that that you're like. Why, why, why is Tron red? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And why is he the bad guy? I, 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 I liked where they were going with it. It's just that should have been again. The, there were elements that would have made this a great film, a a film that you could even go, okay, yeah, it didn't break a lot of technological ground, but God, it was a good film. Um, yeah, they they eh, eh, they're all in there. They just forgot to actually go down those paths. <laughs> It's really annoying when they show you the paths that it could go down uh-huh. and be really exciting, and they don't take them. Yeah. Like, oh, here's this vintage light cycle. That- it's old, but it's the fastest thing on the grid. Great. We'll show you that for 10 seconds, and then it's going to go away and not, and not play a part in the film whatsoever. It's kind of like the writers for this uh, didn't read Chekhov. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like... You you can't you can't show something like that and then not use it and driving it down the bridge is not using it. No, <laughs> and, and, then, a, and yeah, then giving it away. <laughs> yeah, you were expecting when you heard that line from Cora. Yeah, you're thinking, oh, there's gonna be another big light cycle battle coming. Yeah, no, don't get it. No, and this not is uh, the one where I I will kind of shit on the film even though i love watching it is uh the aerial battle at the end which is just light cycles with planes Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah, no that wasn't for me i didn't care for that all that much because i'm like okay you took the one thing that people love most about tron the light cycles and you just did a variation on it and yeah. you dumbed down the uh, not that the light cycle scene wasn't great. I, I enjoyed that, but um, it even when we get to the uh, the critics reviews, uh, one of them, which I wasn't going to read this part, but uh, uh, one of them noted that uh, they they made the cool light cycle sequence only to basically have them still hit each other while on the bikes. I'm like, instead of the cool little turns to to trick people into to destroying themselves, they would pull out their discs and just try to knife each other on the bikes. And I'm like, you're right. Eh, eh, you kind of missed the point of the bikes. <laughs> I'm like, I loved it while they're busy riding around and jumping and they're trapping each other. And then all of a sudden now you just want to beat up on each other while you're sitting next to each other on the bike. That's no fun. No, you know, you have to advance because this is 20 some odd years later. Sure. You know, this is the, you know, the, the, the 2010 and not 1982. So computer technology has increased exponentially, yes. you know, since then. And so, yes, you can have light cycles that swoop and, and dive and, and go up and down and make big arcs and everything. But I got to admit, that's not as cool it's the hardcore 90 degree turn. <laughs> yes, which was all you could do in 1982. You couldn't do a, an arcing curve on a, on a on a game in 1982. You had to do that 90 degree turn and that was just kind of fun and cool. And so it's like, uh, this isn't as neat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it did lose that uh, see the uh, I I made room for the fact that, yes, uh, computers and video games and all that have advanced. So, yes, it makes sense that the grid is a little more fluid than it might have been way back when. But And I'm going to take this opportunity. I am still going to uh, give a shout out to the wonderful placement uh, of the Easter egg of the bits. If you remember from the original movie, Flynn ran into a bit that would just say yes and no. And that was Mm -hmm. a bit Um, when Flynn is in his home in the off grid area um, by the fireplace. He's got two bits that sit on the the fireplace mantle. He picked them up and played with them like uh, uh, those uh, those Chinese ball things. Um, Mm -hmm. um, Okay. he, 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 he fiddled with them, but he put them back down and they were they were literally the red side and the yellow side of the bit. 
So, oh, okay. so they I didn't... made an homage to to the old eight okay. bit days, but <laughs> right. Okay. No, I I did not I did not connect that. I was sitting here just a few minutes ago thinking they didn't do any of the bits. No, nope. <laughs> they didn't do a bit in this film. No, nope, the they, bit they, was they there. They gave them an homage. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the the system is too sophisticated to have simple yes no flying around. <laughs> All right. But but yes, they still included it. But yes, that. That's part of what's fun about the 82 version with the light cycle is because if you are going, if you are a human being on Earth going at speed and take a 90 degree angle, you're liquefied on the inside of your <laughs> of your light cycle if you do that for real, uh, which is why that was fascinating. So, I, yeah, I, too, also miss that, but I did like the uh, the light cycles. I particularly right. liked um, the generation of the light cycles, the, the, the run, uh, the, you have the stick run the jump and it just forms around you. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. And then, uh, you did mention the recognizer earlier. Yes. That look, the, uh, the recognizer update was very cool. Yes. Considering that was probably the thing from 82. That was probably the more little dis. that was kind of, they were cool, but it was kind of like, what is this? How does this work? What? Uh, right. Um, Seeing it form was just very okay. That's just how that happens. Um, mm-hmm. And this recognizer, uh, like it had structure, it made sense the way that it did the things that it did. It, like, okay, that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, the um, the digital tank made a very small cameo at the beginning <laughs> yeah. in this film. Yep, the, the tank routines. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. No. That you could catch. You managed to catch one driving down like a, a, a between buildings in mm-hmm. whatever the city is. Uh, speaking of cameos, uh, Steve Lisberger, who was the director, the writer and director of the original Tron, makes a cameo as a bartender at the in the end of Line Club. Oh, is he in the end of Line Club? <laughs> I didn't know that was him. That's that's cute. I like that. I thought that was that was pretty cool when I read that. Okay, now hopefully you don't have any argument here, but since you brought up the end of Line Club, it's I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about the music. Yeah. Um, nope. I wanted to mention the music. Yeah, because Daft Punk uh, and their score for this this film, you can have all sorts of problems with the story, but you gotta you can't tell me that that music doesn't just kind of make the film i will give you half points on the soundtrack really i think the main theme uh when the orchestra bit at at the beginning uh, actually the very the intro as he's describing the grid and you come in Mm -hmm. on that that is an amazing sequence I, I think the the orchestral bit that they and the music that they weave in is phenomenal with their their techno overlay and everything. But when it's just the techno music, I feel like it's just repetitive. <laughs> well, clearly techno is not your thing. Then. <laughs> See, it doesn't have quite that flavor for me. I wouldn't put it in the, those <laughs> words. Uh, it, 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 but it has. It definitely has a beat. It's got energy to it. And uh, actually, I own the soundtrack. Uh, yeah, and it, it's one of those that I can... It, you have to be in the mood for some of it because it can get a little intense on, on, on some of it. Like the the sequence they play during the fight in the bar um, can get a little... be a little much. Uh, but some of the rest of the sequences throughout are actually pretty cool. Like... Um, um, they even have name. They named everything as if it was written for the grid when the when they did that. So there, there's literally a song called Recognizer. Uh, there's a song called um, um, uh, What is uh, when the when they? I can't believe I blanked on it. Um, when you break a program and it falls apart, uh, deresolution. Deresolution is a song. Um, the grid is a song game. Gotcha. The game is the song. And actually the, uh, that, that opening sequence music as, uh, as a uh, clue is going to walk onto the, onto the, uh, light cycle grid with, with, uh, 
with Sam, the music that they're playing at that is incredibly intense and it's perfect for that moment. So Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, there's some of them I really like. I sure. like I said, the the main theme I think is sure. phenomenal. Oh yeah, the I theme love is that. Yeah, but there's a lot of the other incidental music where it's just this it's like God, just anything change change the tone a note nothing oh and, and yeah. since we were on topic of easter eggs in there there are moments throughout uh speaking of music and sound there are moments where they actually lift some of the uh sound effects out of the original tron movie and overlay them in this so yeah like um when we go the, the sound before they get on the light cycles, the do-do-do sound that comes up. Uh, it's right out of the game and out of the uh, old movie. It's that Those are fun when you catch them. I liked when uh, young Kevin Flynn is showing all the toys, the Tron toys, to his son. And he, he hums the, the Tron theme as he holds up uh, Tron to him <laughs> or no, that's cool. Uh, did you catch the other little trinkets in Sam's uh, childhood bedroom? No, wait, like what? They, he had a poster and an action figure from Black Hole. Yes. Oh, yes, I did see that. Uh, I saw. I definitely saw the poster. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, because there's a little Bob character. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> and, and that was before they have released the more current versions of the black hole action figures. So the fact that there was one, it was kind of like, oh, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, the, that and being a Disney film, uh, it's just, that's a night. Nice, that's a cute little dig right there. <laughs> yeah. It's Here, a nice if you thing. don't like this one, go watch that one. I threw this out to social media and actually surprisingly did not get much in the way of responses. I thought this one would garner Lots of comments. I'm very surprised. Yeah, I was um, expecting a bit. Again. Hmm? I was expecting more. Yeah, no. Uh, I Again, uh, Jay from the rating room is the, like the lone uh, commenter. He says that he loves this film. And it's a shame we won't see the characters return in a third film, as I believe Tron 3 Ares will focus on different characters. Great soundtrack. And I've even got it on vinyl. Nice. Wow. <laughs> of all the films to have the soundtrack on vinyl, yeah. <laughs> there's something sort of like, um, oh, the phrase irony, I think, comes to mind. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, you went analog on a digital movie. <laughs> yes. Interesting choice. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, Jay, for commenting. We appreciate it. Yes. No, that, that was nice of you. Uh, shall we hear? Uh, actually, there's uh, all, too many from the the world of the professionals. Oh, no, absolutely. I would imagine there would be. Yeah, no, uh, I, I'm leaning on um, Metacritic for a lot of this, especially since the, all the paywalls. Um, but uh, I thought that this one was extra entertaining. Uh, this is from the New York Post. Uh, I love... I love the title for the uh, review because it's called Transcendent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, okay, that's fun. So uh, this is from Kyle Smith, uh, and uh, th his opening is extra fun. Uh, it's how to describe the visual scintillation that is Tron Legacy. Ninja Vegas? Black Mass at Best Buy? Whatever. The sequel to uh, 1982's Tron is an eyeball party. The score by Daft Punk, which veers from homages to Hans Zimmer's thundery work in The Dark Knight to a retro 80s synth sound, surpasses magnificence. Many were the moments during action scenes when I nearly shed my customary uh, phlegmatic equilibrium and almost thought hey this is really exciting as for the script <laughs> abort retry fail <laughs> that's why i wanted to read all that that was a fun little excerpt from him um shockingly roger ebert was all over the map he did give it three stars though so he actually kind of likes this but to read his uh full review is 
is messier than I'm used to from him. He doesn't actually kind of formulate a, a thought, but uh, um, it's mostly a review, uh, like just going over the details. But then he go, at the end, he writes, I expect Tron Legacy to be a phenomenon at the box office for a week or so. It may not have legs because its appeal is too one-dimensional for an audience much beyond immediate responders. When 2001 was in theaters, there were fans who got stoned and sneaked in during the intermissions for the sound and light trip. I hesitate to suggest that Tron Legacy, for that for Tron Legacy, but the plot won't suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then to just get into some of the uh, more interesting dark ones because there are plenty for everybody that liked it there's also somebody that didn't like it um, so if we go over to the Miami Herald uh, Rene Rodriguez curiously Tron Legacy makes the same mistake the original did all the best stuff comes in the first act. The rest of the movie is as exciting as an overnight round of computer coding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I agree, but that was fun to read. <laughs> and then uh, the the New York Times, uh, Manolo Dargis, uh, a sequel with far less color and cinematic imagination and many more bells and whistles including the freakishly special affected Mr. Bridges going mono and mono in cyberspace with the grizzled real deal. Twice as much Jeff Bridges does not necessarily mean twice as much entertainment. Bummer. And, and I have to read this one. This is from Wall Street Journal, Joe Morgenstern. We've heard from him before. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure how he got into the movie review act because I have yet to see a movie review from Joe Morgenstern that he liked the film. <laughs> uh, but in this case, uh, and in Metacritic's uh, parlance, this is a 30 out of 100, so pretty low down. Mm -hmm. um, bear with me. This is entertaining to read if you understand any of it. It's... Uh, dispiriting to see how little attention the filmmakers have paid to the dramatic, real human possibilities of the original, or how much they've been overwhelmed by technology's demands. It's as though rogue programs took over the production. I don't know what any of that means. No, okay. <laughs> but that's what he wrote about the film, so... Seriously, it's a pretty much split down the middle. You like this or you hate it. <laughs> yeah, it does not compute. <laughs> that is far catchier than what he just wrote. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, what do you think? I mean, they are talking of doing a Tron 3, again, you know, with the uh, writers and actors strike. God only knows if it's ever going to happen. Right. Or we may have to wait another three you know, 20 some odd years. Well, yeah. And actually I could have it stand to, uh, to wait a little longer. Cause I know at least at one point, I think for it that like Jared Leto was attached. As far as I know, that's still the name that's going around. Right. And I, I know Jared Leto has supposedly done some good work. I'm just not familiar with it. <laughs> uh, understood. Uh, since his time as Joker, and I've seen him in other stuff, and I've just found him to be overrated. Uh, mm -hmm. And it could be just the part in the film that he's in. If he's been in other stuff where he's been truly amazing, I will leave leave room for that to be the case. I've just not seen him in, in any of those. So, yeah, so I'm less than excited at the notion that Jared Leto may be the lead. I'm less excited for the same reason that I was, you know, disappointed, disappointed. by this one. Yeah. You I, I don't want to be disappointed know. again. <laughs> well, I don't want to be disappointed again. I won't be disappointed because I won't expect it from this next film. What can they bring that's new? And maybe that's where they get you back. <laughs> maybe. Maybe they come up with some new technology. It's a problem I have with all... You know, the first Jurassic Park, 
groundbreaking with the the mixture of live uh, or practical effects and uh, computer graphic, you know, computer generated dinosaurs. It was unique. Mm-hmm. It stands out as being unique. All the sequels pale in comparison because Jan been there, done that. And I think that's what you kind of have to come to terms with. Okay, Tron was groundbreaking. Nobody had ever done anything like that at all. Or even the notion of perceiving the computer world like a variation on our real world. That The, mm-hmm. the notion of that was interesting. Um, actually, one of the other critics got way bogged down in the actual technicals of, of it all. Actually, it might have even been Roger, which is why I didn't read all of that. Um, because somebody, and I think it was Roger now that I think about it, had become so enamored with, well, where, where's Flynn's body been all this time? They get into the technical details, and I, I could have a very Star Trek-like uh, cross-examination of that and tell you why maybe that actually did happen. But here's the thing. We've established a world that ex- that they established in 1982. Now, they did do some cutting-edge stuff by having a de-aged... Um, Kevin Flynn in the film um, that hadn't been done much if at all before uh, but it doesn't hit quite right because it wasn't as good as we hoped but if you look back at 1982 the original Tron there's lots of defect in, in, in the stuff that they did but you haven't seen it before so is it enough that a film breaks ground out of the gate, but now they've established a world and they have to live in it. Is that okay, or do you just... What you really want, and I think what you're really asking for, is come up with new content, a new thing altogether, not Tron, and break some new ground somewhere else. A little bit. Yeah, and that's a fair That's a fair thing to say. It is You're saying, and maybe you're saying, I don't know, you just don't want a Tron franchise. You're good with the yeah. first one. This one fell flat. No need for more. Yeah, pretty much exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, it's not a universe where I feel like, oh, there's so much to explore. Those themes you can explore, but they've been explored, and you didn't have to go into the Tron universe to do it. True, but uh, as we've explored in this conversation, there was possibility of breaking ground. It wouldn't have been visual effects wise necessarily. It wouldn't have been a new kind of technology in filmmaking, but that notion of that you could in a computer world spawn new life of some kind that just manifests itself because the conditions were right as Kevin Flynn described in there. We didn't explore that, and that's exactly what should have been explored, and that would have been the groundbreaking thing, is the notion that can we become God ourselves? Can we create something that creates other things? That's the groundbreaking. That's where it needs to go. They missed the boat on this one. Could they do it then? And we didn't even get into the end of this. Um, It was a thing. uh, Let's... Let's be real. The original ta- Tron, the, the reason he got into the grid in the first place is because somebody set out to tra- create a Star Trek style transporter. They wanted to get you from point A to point B through electrons, mm-hmm. uh, which is, again, how I would have that conversation with Roger Ebert as why his body is aging in an, a technological area. It, it, it's because he's trapped. He's just code now. Uh, we can all be boiled down to code, essentially. So let's actually go down that road. That's the the place we need to be. We didn't even explore the fact that Cora, a an ISO and a program, came out as a physical being on the other side. There's some excitement there, but we did nothing with it. <laughs> So no. that's where this needs to go. If they do a new Tron, they need to do something with the notion of man making life out of nothing in a digital realm and what the implications are in that realm and when it can cross into ours. Yes. That's got all sorts of potential. Disney will screw it up. 
No, absolutely, <laughs> because they're they they're not going to go for the cere- cerebral. Yes, and, and that's what will be missing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I am all for the 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 franchises, the series, and the movies that have explored what is life, mm-hmm. what is consciousness. Mm-hmm. I'm all for that. Most of those haven't been appreciated because they went that sure. way. Uh, even like um, the Sarah Connor Terminator series. Yeah. The whole focus of that series really turned into is Cameron alive? Is, is she a being, you know, what, what makes someone alive just because they're made out of flesh and bone versus metal and plastic. Right. And everyone went like, why aren't the robots beating each other up? You know, and the series was canceled. <laughs> and it was so frustrating. Well, yeah. And, and in this day and age of how you can churn out actually, good content because there's so much to be made and so many venues to show it in let it happen uh, and, and stop thinking the audience is dumb as you think it is <laughs> that's the problem and i think that's disney's problem is they they literally they write their scripts off the back of a shampoo bottle <laughs> lather rinse repeat <laughs> lather rinse repeat like okay we get it and some of that can be fun some of the time, but you're allowed to break new ground. You're allowed to explore things and that comic books, Star Wars, all of that stuff, Tron even in this particular case, they have the ability to go down roads that would be amazing to explore, but we're not letting them. And I think no. that's a that's a travesty. Well, with a name like Tron Ares as in god of war yeah uh, not holding out i'm not i'm not expecting a whole lot of real thought provoking um a, a story no coming out of that no and that and then you're going to add jared leto to it so <laughs> right <laughs> yes what are we watching the next time <laughs> all right yeah that's going to do it for tron legacy please let us know your thoughts if you haven't had a chance to maybe you didn't see the posts or you you saw them and you never got around to it uh, to commenting or, or anything, uh, please leave a comment on any of the social media posts that you might have found this episode on, or do send us an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Next time, we are jumping to 2011, and we're going to take a look at a film called Priest. Vampires hunted by church sanctioned martial art experts on souped up jet powered motorcycles in a post apocalyptic world. What could go wrong? And this is Paul Bethany before he becomes Jarvis slash Vision for Marvel. So we'll get a, uh, we'll take a look at this film. We'll talk a little bit about I I've got some stuff to say about this film, which I'm looking forward to discussing uh, on the show in a couple weeks. If you've seen Priest, do drop us a message. Uh, go to our social medias. Send us an email. We'd really appreciate it. <laughs> so that's going to do it, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. End of line.